you so much everyone for joining us with Citizens Climate University this evening. Our topic is mastering media interviews on radio and television and we're lucky enough to have Aaron Virtes on the phone with us tonight. Aaron is the founder of Science Communication Media and before that came by way of 10 years as one of the principal communication experts at Unit of Concerned Scientists. He also served as a director at Cater Communications in DC as well as a Deputy Regional Field Director at Next Generation Climate. And Aaron's uh, proud uh, kind of pastime right now is serving as co-boss at a DC-based PowerPoint, uh, you know, uh, pub crawling nerd night firm where they share brilliant science ideas on the after hours with each other. So I'm gonna pass to you in just a little bit, Aaron, but I always love going over the learning goals and our agenda real quick uh, before uh, we get started. Tonight, we're gonna have three main targets to hopefully really uh, develop all of your um, you know, reasons for attending. And that is focusing on how to develop main messages, anticipating standard and difficult questions within the interview process, and then really drilling down to answer questions in a way that helps journalists, as well as advancing our own goals as an organization as CCL volunteers. And in order to do that, uh, the agenda is pretty straightforward to what Aaron just wrote out there. We're gonna develop messages, stick to messages, and then anticipate questions. So without further ado, Aaron, I'll pass the baton to you, and we're so grateful for you taking the time to join us tonight. Great, thanks so much. And, uh, and I really appreciate being part of this. Um, you know, I've, I've worked in climate and clean energy policy and politics for a little more than 10 years now. Um, so what, when Citizens Climate Lobby has come up for me in the media, it's mostly been seeing all the incredible op-eds uh, that you produce. And that's been something that I think a lot of other organizations view, you should know with a little bit of jealousy because uh, their members are not producing op-eds uh, that prolifically. And that's pretty cool because uh, as you know, uh, you know, policymakers really care about that local media and they're getting summaries of their local op-ed pages uh, every single day from their staff. They wanna know what folks are talking about. Um, so everything we're talking about today is gonna be broadly applicable to media interviews that you're doing. Um, and you know, I, know, I know a lot of it's print, uh, but we're gonna have a bit of a focus on uh, radio and TV, uh, which present their own challenges uh, because they're so condensed and you're so focused on the soundbite. Um, because occasionally uh, you're going to be asked contentious questions and you're going to have to think on your feet to answer them. So I want to talk about some ways to do that effectively. Uh, so we, let's get right into developing messages and some helpful ways to think about that. Uh, there's a ton of schools of thought about message development um, and I tend to take a Bruce Lee approach to this, uh, meaning the way that Bruce Lee developed his martial arts was to just take the stuff that he liked from different disciplines and he never really felt married to any one particular type of message development. Um, so at the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, we have a book called A Scientist Guide to Talking to the Media, and we had some message templates there. And uh, you know, the biggie was talking about, say, a problem, and then you talk about the solution, and then you talk about the action that is gonna fulfill that solution. Uh, there's another group called Compass uh, that works a lot with climate researchers, also folks who work on forest fires, on water availability, uh, and they'll do something that's a little more complex uh, that'll talk about problems and solutions and what you study. And it'll also focus on what a takeaway message is that you want to keep emphasizing over and over again. One of the best tools that I've run into, um, and it's really more than a tool, it's a method in the past couple of years, is called uh, the and but therefore method. And this is developed by Randy Olson. Randy wrote a book called Don't Be Such a Scientist a couple of years ago, and that's how he got on a lot of people's radar in this field. Uh, he also wrote a book more recently called Houston, We Have a Narrative, Why Science Needs Story. And uh, as a filmmaker and as a scientist, I took a really analytical approach on this, and he realized that in forming his own stories and doing his own films, the basic core of the narrative that he was trying to find fit this and but therefore template. Um, and he, he had a key insight in listening to the creators of South Park talk about how they create their show. Um, and if you're not familiar with South Park, they're producing new shows every week that are responding live to things that are happening in the news that they want to parody or satire or make fun of. 
So one of the rules that they use in their script writing is that anytime a character is saying the word and, they try to replace it with the word but or the word so. They try to replace it with connecting words that have more of a consequential relationship and avoid having just a lot of exposition and a lot of words followed by and, 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 and. And, uh, you know, when Randy first told me about this, I, I had the reaction that a lot of other folks who work in science communication, who work in policy do. It's, well, that sounds interesting. I've been to a lot of presentations. I've been to a lot of talks. I've sat in a lot of media interviews that go and, 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 uh, because we care so much about the facts, because we want people to know what we know, because we think if they just knew what I knew, they would agree with me on all these policy outcomes. Uh, but instead, we have to tell people, a little bit more of a story. We have to give them the and, what we know. We have to give them the but, the tension, the thing that we're trying to solve, and the therefore. What's the takeaway? Uh, what does that mean for you? Um, so if you, you can advance the slide here. Um, these other templates, I feel like a lot of them that you run into, you'll find that there's an and, but, therefore, an ABT that they can be boiled down into. Um, so I really try to spend a lot of time thinking uh, at the level of writing a report or editing a, the report, uh, at the level of prepping somebody for an interview of trying to boil it down to this ABT and these three key messages that you want for whatever project you're working on. Um, so I worked with some of the folks at CCL ahead of the webinar to come up with some and but therefores that might be useful for you. Um, so we know that climate change is important and we need bipartisan solution, but we have a problem. Uh, policymakers need to see local support for climate action to overcome all the polarization around this issue. And that's a lot of what CCL does, right? So we're organizing to get our members of Congress to work on solutions. We know what the world is like, we know what we need, but here's the thing, the thing that's in our way. So this is what we're all about. We're all, we're all about getting that barrier out of the way and building real bipartisan solutions on climate change. And another example, we need a price on carbon to combat climate change, right? This is what all the economists are telling us. This is what all the experts have to say. But policymakers don't want to introduce a new tax without taking away an old one. So that's why we're proposing a tax swap that would help us solve climate change and put money back in our pockets, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk to you about a price on carbon, or as I love Bob Inglis sometimes, he'll, he'll say it's a carbon tax, <laughs> a price on carbon, right? We have to deal with the fact that policymakers have some resistance to that, but the good news is we've already thought about that. That's why we have this great policy that we're pushing for that has bipartisan support. Great. Cool. So, um, we came up with a couple questions and answers. Um, I think the biggest thing we run into in our field is a too much information problem. Um, so we have this instinct where, um, you know, a reporter might ask, so why is your group on the Hill lobbying about climate change today? And, and our instinct is to answer, well, the thing you have to understand about climate change is the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is more than 400 parts per million. That's much higher than it was in pre-industrial times. So what we need to do is put policies in place to reduce carbon dioxide. And this is what you would see at the opening of a report, uh, even in the executive summary, that sort of thing, right? Uh, always kind of going back to first principles. And for journalists, especially broadcast journalists, they're, they're thinking about the three minute, four minute, five minute segment max that they're gonna be able to do on something. Uh, so we have, to, we have to condense things a lot and we have to jump ahead. Um, so giving a reporter what they need and, and getting to that core message that is probably going to make it into the story, not the big explainer. Uh, what's your group doing on the Hill lobbying about climate change? Well, politicians are too divided on climate change at a time when we really need solutions. So we're showing them there's a bipartisan way forward, and that's carbon fee and dividend. Right? So this, this is the, the but and the therefore part of the message, and we're using that to answer yeah, the kind of opener question that you'd get when you're, when you're doing a Hill lobby day. So why is your group on the Hill? And you got, you got to drill yourself with this. Pretend you're getting asked the same question over and over again, because that, that's a lot of media work. Well, we want Representative Robertson to know that she has local support for bipartisan climate action. This isn't another hot button red versus blue issue. It's something people in her district care about deeply, right? Uh, so that, that same kind of message boiled down to the specific member level, right? Uh, and this is the sort of thing um, to uh, uh, one of the attendees earlier talked about, you know, in, in um, 
these TV interviews, if it's recorded and it's getting cut into a soundbite and you're only gonna have one or two sentences taken away from it, these would be a fine one or two sentences to get taken away from it that can be delivered pretty quickly. Um, so it's having those messages internalized. You're just, you're repeating and coming back to them. Uh, so it's worth thinking about why journalists ask these questions. So why are you on the Hill today? Uh, that's just kind of a setup question, right? They're starting the conversation. Um, a lot of the times journalists are really looking for quotes to fill in their stories, um, either for print or for broadcast. Um, so they're prompting you to say something that they can use to fill in a story. And they might be thinking of that story, um, you know, kind of like Lego bricks that they're putting together, taking apart, rearranging as they try to make a narrative for their readers. So the question they're asking is like, okay, is this person giving me a, a brick I can work with? Or am I taking part of this quote and putting it in there? And, and a lot of times after you deliver a good quote or a good line, with a journalist that you can kind of sense them going, yep, got it. Yeah, that's what I need for my story. And then they'll move on to their next question. Uh, other times you get questions where they're looking for specific examples they can use in their stories. Uh, journalists will often say, you know, I need a nugget for the story. They'll talk about it like that, right? I need, I need again, one of these Lego bricks I can drop into the stories. So they need a, they need a vignette. Um, you know, where did you come in from today? How big is your group? Um, you know, how many of you could make it to DC? What was it, what was your organizing meeting like before you came here? Stories, what got you interested in climate change? Um, you know, being able to have a quick message about why I care about this and why I'm here today and how that relates back to the main message, to the goal. Statistics, um, you know, how many people are on your email list? How big is your organization? How much money have you fundraised? How many of these meetings have you had? How many members are in the Climate Solutions Caucus? Uh, journalists really need that stuff to do their stories. So, so having that like a sheet with those quick facts on it and having those quick facts be something that's integrated into your main messages or alongside your main messages, that's really useful. That's, that's the substance of what they need. And for political journalists specifically, they're often asking those questions to get a sense of how big and powerful a group is or how influential a group is. And those markers are really important. Uh, one of the other big reasons journalists ask questions is just to keep you talking. And it's kind of funny to put it this way, but you know, not, not every question that's asked needs a direct literal answer because in a lot of cases, what a journalist is doing is just keeping the conversation going because they're trying to draw more out of you because they need constituent parts for their stories. And some journalists, you know, they have different tactics for doing this, right? Um, you want to you start a conversation in a warm, open way, building some common ground. Um, they might throw things, well, you know, other, some people say this about your issue, you know, what do you think about that? Kind of bringing in outside voices for you to react to. Um, that's part of them keeping you talking and filling that stuff in with their stories. Sometimes journalists, um, it can be really unnerving. They'll, they'll just stop talking and then you feel like, oh gosh, I have to fill this in. Um, and you can, you can turn that around with a live interview too. Uh, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but like if you're in a live interview on the radio or TV and you stop talking, they'll just ask another question. Like they don't do dead air. Um, and you can use that uh, to your advantage in a way too, right? Like if you decide I already got my main message out, you can just stop and then they'll ask another question and, and the interview will go from there. Uh, so sticking to messages, uh, it, it can be really challenging um, and in understanding why journalists are asking questions and what they're looking for, uh, it can help you, it can help you bridge back to your messages when you get some challenging questions. Um, and uh, the Paul Offit video is next, right? Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, let's bring that up and then, okay, there's a little bit of setup here. Um, I really like this, I really like bringing in this clip because it's kind of a climate adjacent issue because it has to do with science, uh, but it's a public health issue. Uh, and this is Dr. Paul Offit. Um, and uh, he's, he's, uh, he's, a he's a pediatric uh, scientist and uh, he works a bit on epidemiology too. And he became the leading voice in the vaccine debate um, in, in trying to get the message out that vaccines are not causing autism, right? And to keep vaccinating your kids. Uh, this, this is still something that scientists are dealing with a lot today. Um, this was around the height of the controversy, and what had happened was the Lancet, a uh, major medical journal, had published 
research linking vaccines to autism. It's really controversial. They wound up retracting it. And actually the guy who did that study wound up losing his medical license, big scandal for him. Uh, so this is a moment for Paul Offit where his viewpoint in the scientific community had really been vindicated. This, in our world, this would be the equivalent of having a scientist on because um, you know some, some really bad climate contrarian paper got retracted, that sort of thing. Uh, so this is, this is a CBS morning show interview. It's only three minutes um, and it's really challenging. Um, in listening to this, listen to the literal questions that he's asked and listen to how he responds. Uh, and keep in mind that his audience here are millions of people um, watching at home over breakfast, getting, re getting ready to send the kids off to school. And he really keeps that audience in mind. Dr. Paul Offit is Chief of Infectious Diseases at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He is also author of the book, Autism's False Prophets. Good morning, Dr. Offit. Good morning. You've been a longtime proponent of vaccines, maintained that they do not cause autism for a long time. Do you believe this reversal by The Lancet will finally put an end to that debate? Well, I hope so. I mean, it's certainly a long time in coming. Uh, the paper obviously was, was critically flawed. It, it should have never been published. And, and science uh, done since then has clearly shown that, that the MMR vaccine didn't cause autism. The problem was is it started a firestorm. Hundreds of children in the United Kingdom and Ireland were hospitalized. Four children were killed by measles virus, a virus could have been, that could have been safely and easily prevented by vaccinations. This retraction will not uh, give those children their lives back, but hopefully Hopefully it'll, it'll save other children for, from succumbing to this uh, completely preventable infection. You've gone as far as saying, Dr. Offit, that the editors of The Lancet should be held responsible for the deaths of those children that weren't vaccinated? Well, I, I think there are a lot of people who, who should be held responsible here. Obviously, the, those who, who, uh, who the authors of the paper um, were shown by the General Medical Council to have acted un, unethically, and, and, and the journal uh, withdrew the paper in part because they felt that the data had been falsified or misrepresented. I think that the editors should be held accountable. Four, four of the six people who reviewed that paper recommended that it be rejected, yet still it was published. I think the media, you jumped on this paper as if it was fact, when I think, you know, you could argue, I think as Carl Sagan has, that ex extraordinary claims should be backed by extraordinary evidence. This was an extraordinary claim that was backed by virtually no evidence and obviously has never been reproduced. Well, but it, it's hard to argue with parents who are so convinced that their child took a dramatic turn after receiving the vaccine, and they are absolutely convinced, no matter what The Lancet says now, that a vaccine caused their child's autism. What do you say to them? Yeah, I, I think I can certainly understand where they're coming from. Their child was fine, they got a vaccine, and then they weren't fine anymore. Could the vaccine have caused it? That, that's a question that fortunately can be addressed in a scientific venue. Mm. You know, you look at hundreds of thousands of children that did or didn't receive MMR vaccine to see whether the instance of autism was greater in the vaccinated group, and it wasn't. You know, I, the story that I tell, because it's a, it's a, it's a good one, you know, my wife's in private practice pediatrics. She came into her office one day. She was pulling up uh, into a syringe a vaccine. A four-month-old was sitting on her mother's lap uh, uh, at waiting for the, for the vaccine, and the child had a seizure. She had a seizure while my wife was pulling that vaccine up into a syringe. If that vaccine had given, been given five minutes earlier, I think there's no amount of statistical data in the world that would have convinced that mother otherwise, and it's understandable. But, uh, but these are scientific questions that can be answered. They have been answered. I, I would only plea with parents you know, to believe the science that clearly has exonerated vaccines here. All right, Dr. Paul Offit, thank you so much. Th thank you. And you can read more about this study on our website, earlyshow.cbsnews. So uh, again, for broadcast interviews, three minutes, that's all he had. So he only got to talk about three or four times in that entire interview. Um, so some of the stuff uh, we touched upon already uh, from the Offit interview, uh, who's to blame? Lots of people. Uh, you know, if he, if he had taken that question at face value and only talked about the Lancet, that reporter would have asked some follow-ups about how the Lancet could be held accountable. Should scientists boycott the Lancet? Should the editorial board be fired? Uh, and then he would have spent this huge broadcast interview spending three minutes talking about something those millions of people have no control over, right? There's no Lancet editorial board members watching this at home. He knows who his real audience is. Um, so, so he doesn't go down a wonkier rabbit hole. Uh, what would you say to the parents? He, he leads with the sympathy and the empathy. Then he talks about the science. 
uh, and he has this story, and I, I wound up showing this to uh, a couple public health professionals, uh, which is kind of interesting. I showed them climate interviews first, and then we looked at public health interviews. Uh, one of them said, oh gosh, you know, I've worked with Paul and I've heard him tell that story a hundred times. I'm so sick of hearing him tell that story. He tells it every talk. And I said, that's great. <laughs> that means it works. He, he knows that it resonates with his audience. And uh, I'm sure some of you have heard this, but that, you know, there's this old adage um, in marketing and that you hear versions of it in politics too. But by the time you're sick of repeating a message, that's when it's probably just starting to sink in with your audience. And a lot of this stuff can feel repetitive, but that's okay. Repeating stuff is good. I, I think anyone who's worked in uh, private sector marketing will tell you repetition can be pretty awesome. Uh, he stops, right? Uh, we talked about that a little bit already, um, but he knows that once he's got his message done, he's done. Um, and he talks a little fast, it, you know, he squeezes a lot in there. Um, but stopping is really powerful. And Catherine Hayhoe does this in a lot of her broadcast interviews too. And it's like, okay, I said my bottom line message about the science. I said my bottom line message about wind energy in Texas. And she stops. And then other people say, well, thanks, Dr. Hayhoe. You know, what do you have to say about this? And she gets to go on to her next message. Uh, he squeezes in a closer. This is really important for broadcast interviews as you sense the interview winding down. Um, you know, they, they start to say thanks very much, or, uh, you know, you hear the music for the commercial break coming on, whatever it is, uh, you know, you have five or six seconds there to squeeze in a closer and you can just close and just saying thanks. Um, but more often than not, what you're, what you're going to want to do is just squeeze in one more main message or say, uh, thanks. And I really hope everybody can make it to our next organizing meeting on November 3rd. Please head, you know, please head to our website. Yeah, do a quick plug before you leave. There's, there's no shame in that. Part of your audience is interested in action and you wanna remind them about how to take action so they, they can become active with us too. Um, so yeah, big, big fan of how off it operates. Um, you gotta understand what's really being asked. You wanna address the question. Um, and again, I love that first answer that he had because he didn't dodge it. He, it's not that he didn't wanna talk about the Lancet. He just didn't wanna get stuck on it. Uh, and then relate the question back to your main messages. Um, and Todd and I brainstormed uh, a couple typical questions that we run into, and I actually wanted to spend uh, the rest of our time uh, on these. And I got a couple other tough questions that can come up in this space generally. Uh, just open it up to uh, some conversation and some ideas. because I think this demonstrates um, the sort of mental exercises you wanna go through. Uh, to prepare yourself for an interview. And I really like over-preparing. I like thinking about really, really tough, difficult, hard, flummoxing questions that make me angry. And then if I'm able to answer those effectively in my head, usually the questions that I'm getting asked in a real interview are a lot easier to answer. Uh, and I, I think it's like anything else. If you, if you practice harder than you play, playing becomes easy. Um, all right, so uh, is your policy intended to put an entire industry out of business? Um, you don't have to buy into that premise that people are going out of business, right? Economists have told us for decades that the fastest, cheapest, simplest, most effective first step in solving the climate cr crisis is to price all sources of energy according to their actual social cost, right? And, that, and that's why we have this price on carbon. Um, so it's not about any one business, it's about all the businesses. It's about how we price carbon in the economy. Wouldn't a warmer climate be better in most ways? You can, you can get into the handful of crops <laughs> that are gonna do better on climate change. They're not staple crops, right? Uh, but instead, what's really being asked? Is this gonna be as bad as people say? Well, future generations will spend trillions of dollars cleaning up the mess we're making today by burning fossil fuels, just because they appear to be cheaper than other sources of energy, but they're really not. That's why we need to price all this stuff. Uh, isn't it crazy to think that the president would sign a bill like yours? Never underestimate crazy in politics. Uh, again, you don't, you don't have to get bogged down in a conversation about Trump uh, if you wanna talk about climate solutions. All roads to climate solutions run through the Congress. Congress is the branch of government with the authority to levy fees on the carbon in fossil fuels, right? So coming back to how you're organizing, what you're organizing on, 
not getting bogged down in some of these other questions. Um, so let's transition to the next slide. Um, gotcha questions can be really tough. Journalists want to test your position to resolve potential hypocrisies, perceived hypocrisies. I think one of the really tough questions climate advocates um, have gotten historically that they still get uh, is around biofuels and some of the negative consequences of those big investments in biofuels and the economic consequences they had, uh, the environmental consequences they had. We're getting a lot of tough questions about natural gas and methane and leakage. And well, you know, you guys said that was a solution, didn't kind of work out. Uh, I think you all are really well positioned to answer questions like that because you're talking about such a fundamental solution with carbon pricing. Um, it won't work. Uh, journalists are inherently pessimistic, right? So having our, and I don't, not personally, but they're, again, their job is to test what advocates are saying against tough questions, right? Um, so it won't work. Well, where are places where it has worked, right? And we know there's tons of places that have had success and are having success with carbon pricing. Um, I, I was curious to hear about your all's experiences with this. Um, I find that when I organize Hill meetings, journalists are often like, like they really want to press me on how the meeting went and what was said. And they, they kind of like, they want to get that little bit of insider view of things. And uh, uh, the T word Trump, uh, he's, he's an attention generating machine. Uh, every morning he spends 12 minutes on Twitter and then thousands of people, thousands of journalists are writing about what he says. Millions of people are paying attention to it. Uh, it is huge. Um, so decide how much of your message you want to be Trump related. Uh, it might be useful for a given communications goal. It might be something you really just want to skip past. Um, but it's always out there, especially because the, um, the antipathy toward climate policy has just been so prominent at the federal level. Um, emphasizing real support. Um, I think this has been a nice thing since the election. Uh, journalists don't always have a great sense of how to cover social movements, how to cover in-person political action. It, it's more straightforward in some ways to write about things like Democrats and Republicans taking out big ad buys and polling uh, and these sort of, this sort of other stuff that tends to make up political coverage. For grassroots stuff, it's just kind of harder to get your head around in some ways. And you know, those of us who spend a lot of time at organizing meetings, going to marches, planning this stuff, um, we wind up developing a better intuitive sense of this sort of thing over time or how much momentum there is in a community uh, behind a given effort or the tone of what town halls sound like over time. So I think since the election, because there's been this huge outpouring of civic engagement, our jobs have gotten kind of easier. Like the utility of people hitting the streets, doing Hill meetings, uh, that energy around civic engagement, the utility of it is more obvious just because a lot of people are doing it. Um, so the kind of questions I'm getting are more like, how are you focusing this additional energy and attention? And I, again, I think you all are really well positioned on that because you, you have a game plan, you have a goal, you're implementing it. Uh, and then the red versus blue stuff on climate, uh, I think is really hard and I think it's gotten harder. Um, so one of the really good examples that I've seen in your all's coverage is being able to point to uh, defense related climate research, right? And being able to protect some of that. So pointing to something recent and concrete where bipartisan action has helped us. Uh, thinking back to last year, the tax credit extensions for wind and solar were huge. Um, so I think that's something people know about a lot in our space. One of the things that I, I think is gonna get tougher is the degree to which the Republicans who are coming into the fold on climate uh, can really translate that into action and have stuff they can point to. Uh, and then I think from the blue perspective, I think we're going to see a lot more progressive challengers to mainstream Democrats. Political context will be challenging for us because um, for a lot of the policymakers, they want to use climate as a symbol of I'm reasonable. Uh, and, and meanwhile, all of us who've been working on climate for years are kind of like, they're talking about us. Yay. Can we translate it into action? Uh, but folks will constantly want us to take sides in ways that maybe don't feel exactly related to our issue. Um, I've, I've gotten to do a few workshops. Uh, this is Alan Alda. Um, I, I don't know if you can recognize him laughing in the middle there, but he's, uh, uh, he really cares deeply about science communication, uh, which is kind of neat because we, we don't get a lot of celebrities <laughs> who want to hang out with scientists and promote science. We've got Neil Tyson, we've got Bill Nye, and we've got Alan Alda. 
uh, he does these incredible improv workshops with scientists that I, I love. Uh, Cause again, scientists are super literal minded. Improv is like, it's not accurate to put it this way, but like a very left brain activity. It's very non-literal. Someone can say something completely weird and inaccurate and you can't respond to it with contradiction or correction. You have to go, yeah, and, and then you come up with the next thing. Um, and I think when we're developing messages and thinking creatively about ways to respond, totally use improv rules, be really creative. Um, and for drilling yourself on media interviews, um, you know, at the beginning or end of an organizing meeting or off to the side, ask each other a couple hard questions and see if you can stay on message and make a game out of it. Um, and, you know, one, th one thing I do, um, you know, in idle time, like a car trip or something like that, I kind of go through that mental exercise of, uh, okay, you know, what if um, I was doing the radio interview that I just listened to and I had gotten that question? How would I have answered? Uh, or, gosh, I saw somebody online who just had such a horrible message about climate change. And, uh, you know, what if, what if someone had asked me that in the middle of a broadcast interview? How would I respond to it? And doing that kind of talk through exercise uh one it can be kind of cathartic when you run into media coverage you don't like but two that's how you drill yourself on these skills and get better um so improv rules are awesome for that kind of brainstorming uh, and that kind of creative activity and then you can use that fodder that you produce uh when you have time later to to cut away come up with those fine main messages and feel like you're uh you're just really drilled on these skills and that when it is time for that interview when it comes up and oh my gosh i'm going to go to a tv studio or i got to get on the phone in you know 20 minutes to talk to a radio producer you have that mindset and you feel like you're, like you're an actor on stage now you can be on i love it Aaron. no i think that's a wonderful place to close uh, I do not want us to end with our time with you. You have been just a wonderful wellspring of information and helpful tips and just insights that I think really has deepened all of our ability to really be prepared for media workshop interviews. Um, but Todd, do you want to quickly just share how people from here can get involved with the Broadcast Media Action Team? Right. Thanks, Brett. Um, I hope that everyone on this webinar tonight will uh, proceed directly to community and join the action team so we can continue this conversation. I, I find this topic to be just completely fascinating. Uh, the idea of uh, hearing a question and then answering with one of uh, my pre-prepared talking points I think is such a hard thing to do and in future webinars we'll, we'll uh, break out into breakout rooms and practice that, that skill. Uh, here's how to join our action team. Go to community, log in. If you don't have a login, you can click the button at the login that says, give me a login. Get yourself logged into community. At the top of the screen, you see one of the options is connect. Click on that. Uh, about halfway down, you'll see one of the options is action teams directory. Click that and that will take you to a screen where you'll see all of the action teams. Uh, brand new action team. I think the newest action team is Broadcast Media. That's where we're going to continue this conversation. Uh, click Broadcast Media and uh, in the middle of the screen, closer to the bottom, you'll see a button that says Join Group. Uh, click that Join Group button and you will instantly be, a, you don't have to be approved or anything, you'll instantly be a member of the Broadcast Media Action Team. Uh, Flannery and I are the co-leads of that action team. We're looking for a volunteer uh, co-lead to join us. So if any of you are interested in being a, a co-lead on this action team, uh, that would be great. Just let us know. Uh, next month, we are going to have as our guest speaker, Catherine Hayhoe. So we're all excited about that. It's going to be a great call. She will give us her guidance on how she prepares for radio and TV interviews. I love it. Thank you so much, Todd. And just as we promised, if anyone's interested after tonight to get in touch with Aaron, here is Aaron's email. Here is Aaron's Twitter handle. I know you're very active online. Well, we really appreciate, again, the time that you've had to spend and share your insights with us in preparing to do television and media interviews. I know Aaron said he's available if for whatever reason we didn't get to anything for uh, tonight. On behalf of everyone at Citizens Climate University, thank you for your time. Thank you for your ongoing advocacy efforts. We hope you found tonight's lesson enjoyable and have a wonderful week ahead, everyone.